I was thinking before, is this on now? Yep. I was thinking before, Rick, when you mentioned about the European man out the front there and giving you a $100 bill, and I thought, was it a $100 euro? <laughs> but isn't it lovely how God gives you these encouragements and uh, unexpected at this time? And also, it came to mind that I was to preach at Yandina Church uh, on the 27th of last month, but I was sick, and I'd, it was two and a half weeks before I got over it, but I've got a spare sermon, so if you need it in the next two weeks, brother, I could help out, <laughs> maybe in that context again. Well, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to look at a couple of passages. Today's message is a faith that doesn't hold on to hurts. A faith that doesn't hold on to hurts. So if you look in your Bibles there in James chapter 5 and verse 13, there's these three little phrases, like little staccato phrases. It said, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let him call the elders. So that first little phrase of verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Or the word suffering there can be translated if any one among you vexed, is anyone among you troubled or afflicted or simply, is anyone among you hurt? Let him pray. Take your hurt to the Father. Take your hurt to the Heavenly Father. This, after all, friends, is what our Lord Jesus did. In the book of James, the Lord Jesus' name is only mentioned twice, but he's referred to as the Lord of glory. Now, James the brother of the Lord who, or half-brother who wrote this book. Don't get any confused with Peter, James and John. But James, the brother or half-brother of the Lord, he never referred originally to Jesus as the Lord of glory. It was after the resurrection when God's spirit worked in his heart. And he, like his brother Jude, who wrote the book of Jude and his own mother, at one stage they all thought that Jesus was mad and they came to take him away. And I'm sure there were many other times that our Lord Jesus was hurt by the misunderstanding of those in his own household that he fellowshiped with, that he had Passover with every year for many, many years. No doubt he was hurt about that. How did he deal with all that? Well, I'm suggesting he took it to the Father. He prayed. You know, he got up early and he went to the Father and prayed. He often went to the mountain and he prayed. I'm sure he included those things. And then toward the with his beginning of his ministry, remember our Lord prayed earnestly and he prayed all night for the 12 disciples. <laughs> but they had such a little understanding of the things that the Lord Jesus said. And I'm sure that if you're a teacher of, your, of people and they don't get it, it hurts, it disappoints you. How did he cope with that? He took it to the Father. Then he was betrayed. He was hurt in betrayal. He was denied by Peter, hurt by Peter, his close friend. He was abandoned by all his disciples. How did he deal with all that at those last moments? Well, he took it to the Father in prayer. Yes, he couldn't go off to the mountain and pray, but he could take it directly to the Father and ask the Father, as it were, to come and take the sting out of the hurt that he might do his will. Now, at the end, in the last day when... Judas betrayed him. Remember, uh, he came and kissed Jesus and one of the servants, uh, Malchus, had his ear cut off. The Lord Jesus said, you know, I could have called 12 legions of angels to my aid an almighty display of power could have come in an instant and brought closure to his suffering and hurt, but that would have thwarted the plan and purposes of God. And he never did it. He distrusted his father and he prayed to God about all these things that were coming upon him. And so are we. We receive Christ Jesus by faith, so we live in him by faith. And if we're hurt, if we're suffering, if we're afflicted or vexed, whatever it is, the word of God says pray. Bring it to the Father with open hand. Let him take it and blow it away, whatever it is. I don't mean to minimise those hurts, but the scripture's saying, if you're suffering, if you're hurting, pray, bring it to the Father. Now God, the God of our, Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, he's in the strong faith growing business. And if you come to Christ, your troubles and hurts actually are only just commencing in one way. But we must learn not to allow these hurts to paralyse us and we must be careful that we do not cause unnecessary hurt at all to others. 
There's three things I want to emphasise today, and if you've already had a quick glance through the bulletin, you'll see what they are. And as I read and scanned through the book of James, there's just three I want to mention. First of all, we are to have a faith that doesn't hold on to hurts that come through the tongue. A faith that doesn't hold on to hurts that comes through the tongue. Now, in the book of James, there's five times the tongue is mentioned. You know, the tongue is an amazing part of our bodies. Um, we couldn't eat our food and move it around in our mouth and taste it without our tongue. But it's not talking about that. In that context, it's talking about the speech and expression that God has given to each of us because we can hurt each other so easily. So if you've got your Bibles yet, I want to read a portion of Scripture with you. James 1 and verse 26. This is one instance here. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this man's religion is vain. And then in chapter 3 and verse 5 and following, perhaps one of the most extensive passages of Scripture in relationship in the New Testament relationship to the tongue, James wrote, or writes this. So first of all, verse 4, Look at the ships also. Though they are so great, they're driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So, verse 5 of chapter 3, So the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is an unrighteous world among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the cycle of nature and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by humankind. But no human being can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brethren, this ought not to be so. And so we see something there of the power of the tongue. Just think about the power of the tongue being a fire in our society. Generally, think about what you hear. Think about question time in our national parliament. I know of teachers who used to, for many years, take their children to listen to and look at parliament and go to question time who no longer go there because of the language and the vitriol and the stuff that happens there during question time. If this is our leaders, the way they speak in those times, wow, it's sad, isn't it? Look what's happening with people and hurt through SMSs and Facebook language, the scourge of domestic violence and the things we see enacted on our TV um, in relationship to, say, adverts about that and the use of the tongue and people cowering. Um, road rage and the tongue and violence coming from there. It, it's just everywhere, is it not? And we see something of, of the power of the tongue being like a fire and bushfire brings destruction. The book of Proverbs says these things. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The mind of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. May our lips, may our tongue be that which feeds many. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. May our tongue, may the words that we say as believers in Christ bring healing. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. So let's be very careful. We can, we can either bring life or kill it by what we say to others overall. So here we are, friends. We can sing praises one moment to our God from heaven who has made us and we can slander someone the next. <laughs> what a strange lot we are. We can get caught up in gossip and lies if we're not careful and never think for one moment that you've ever mastered your tongue. So the moment that you think you've got it all under control, something will happen, something will boil over, somebody might get hurt. There's three things I just want to touch on in relationship to the faith that doesn't hold on to hurts through the tongue. Marriage and family, member to member, pastor and people. What about marriage and family? Now these are the most intimate relationships we can have. And so I ask the question, 
Why is it that those that we love the most, we hurt the most? <laughs> Why is it that those we love the most, we hurt the most? And we hurt them often with our tongue. The scripture there tells us in James to be slow to anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. In relationship to your marriage, you might have some late nights, but that's okay. It's better to deal with it in love. And if you have some issues going on together and it's a bit sensitive, it's better to say, I'm not in a position right at the moment to discuss this issue. Could we come back to it a little later? Buy some time, go for a walk. But you can say that in a way which is open and inclusive in that sense, but recognises there's an issue to deal with. But you don't have to lash out at it. You don't have to deal with it straight away. You can just put it on the shelf a little bit, come back later and deal with it under God. So that you're honouring God and you're honouring your spouse at the same time. Marriage is the union of two good forgivers. I remember hearing that on a Perth radio station 30 years ago. It's true, is it not? Marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Yes, of course, we to give, forgive anybody, particularly in marriage. It's the union of two good forgivers, learning to forgive one another because we're most close to each other. And also, in relationship to marriage, there's a direct relationship between your walk with God and your relationship with others. I remember over 30 years ago now talking to my wife, Deb, at that stage in, in Gordon Park. I must have had um, something we were sharing about and then I went down to my study to open up my Bible on that and she knew that with this less than five minutes I'd be up again apologising for whatever it was. I can't remember what it was but what she said was right. I came back up the stairs, we talked about it, we forgave each other, I can move on. Because you can't maintain a vibrant relationship with God with unresolved issues, generally speaking. You need to go and fix them up as promptly and as quickly as is reasonable because that's how God operates and that's how things operate in our own lives. So in relationship to your marriages as a whole, I just want to make some little comments. Remember that you're joined heirs with the grace of God. Keep God, keep Christ central in your relationship together. Remember that you're genuine friends first and speak as friends because sometimes you think, look at it this way, in a marriage relationship, you would never speak to a friend in certain ways, so don't speak to your partner in a certain way either. Keep it, value them. Be genuine friends, speak respectfully. You're genuine friends as well as lovers. That you're separate individuals and you're a couple. Focus on your strengths, not your difficulties always. Learn together in a calm way to negotiate the different things you're going to go through in life and learn to compromise. Talk to and about one another positively at all times. Know that you can face and have the courage to resolve the conflicts that whatever you go through. See the relationship that you're in as a shared responsibility and a joy. Remember and go over the shared values and practices them that you find in the scripture and in your life. Share your dreams and hopes and verbalise them with each other. This you can do. In this way you can honour God. In this way you keep the tongue from, and your tongue from um, slipping into evil or hurting your partner. What about in generally other relationships within the family? You know, you heard the little phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones but names can never hurt me. Do you remember that one? Is it true? Well, I don't think it's true at all. As a young kid, my nickname by my brothers was Weed, W-W-E-D. It had nothing to do with cannabis. <laughs> I think it was just skinny, but Weed. Now, I hated it, but they used it all the time. They used to tease me with it. Well, if you see that as parents with one another, pull up, pull them up. Pull up your siblings or your children. There's no way to speak to them. It hurts them. My father also, a man of his time and his age, I don't know whether he ever thought about it, but for many years he would say, oh, you're useless, Mark. You can't do anything right. What a damaging tape to go round and round and round in my mind. It took me 30 years to wash it out. 
And then one day in 1980, having been in Queensland for a year, went back home. My father was saying the same thing to his 13-year-old stepson. And I stepped in and said, Dad, you can't keep saying that. I said, you said it to me. It took 20 years to get it out of my system or whatever. But you can't keep saying to him. So you've got to be very, very careful what you say to those whom you say that you love. We need to discover and practice healthy ways of relating where there's no fighting, fleeing or freezing. Never let bitter jealousy and selfish ambition simmer in your heart. And this is the crux of it, friends, that we're made, God has made us for peace and joy in our relationship, both with God and with each other. And we're not made to carry indefinitely unresolved conflict and hurt. God hasn't made us that way. We're to enjoy peace and harmony in our relationship, not unresolved conflict and hurt. And where there is unresolved conflict and hurt, take it to God and do something about it if you can. Take somebody with you, get some counsel, get some help. Because it's worth it. You need to be liberated and freed from these things and not allow the tongue to, and, and the hurts of the tongue to cripple your faith overall. What about fellow members to members? Well, in the scripture, you read Paul said in Philippians 2 to Erodia and Sinchi, they were having some sort of a misunderstanding. Well, obviously got to Paul that there was a big you know, beef going on, so he write to them to be one in the Lord. So it does happen. You can fall out with one another. And then in Acts 15, Paul, the right said that there was a sharp contention that arose between Paul and Barnabas over mission. Paul went one way, Barnabas went another way. So there was something again said with the tongue or vision or whatever happened, and they separated their ways. These things happen, and you have to deal with them. I remember being in a, a members meeting, which I was chairing, in, in Perth many years ago and I had to adjourn the meeting because one of the older ladies was just screaming out at the top of her voice. We couldn't hear what was going on. I just adjourned the meeting and asked the deacons and elders to come and sit down the front and said, oh, what's, what's going on? And try to understand her need at that particular time and somehow move on. Sometimes, friends, biting your tongue and keeping back sharp or Harmful words produces a remarkable sweetness. Remarkable. Think about what you're going to say before you say it to somebody else who's a member in the Lord. If you suffer humiliation at the hands of unkind people, will get your eyes off yourself. Put it onto our Lord Jesus. And Theo and Bob, your grandmother was right. If you don't have something kind to say to somebody, don't say anything at all. I'll pick you out because... Your grandmother would probably say that. <laughs> Think about if envy, if bitterness, if self-pity, if anger get in your way, deal with them. Limit the problems that you create for other people. Think about that. Limit the problems you might create for other people. Make an intentional desire and commitment in your heart and I will limit that. I will think about what I'll say to my brother or sister. I don't want to cause unnecessary offence. I want to speak the truth in love, but I'm going to limit what I'm going to say because it might take a long time to repair it otherwise. And then pastor and people. Friends, the man that loves you the most is the man that tells you the most truth about yourself. As pastor from the pulpit, Amongst his people and they're visiting, sharing together to speak the truth in love. That's true. Rick Warren has a recipe book called, and has a section in there about eating pasta. P-A-S-T-A, not P-A-S-T-O-R. Eating pasta. We don't want to be in a situation where, as members, we are eating up our pastor or our elders. We want to be in a situation where we pray for them. But it's a two-way thing. If someone in the pastoral team is speaking rudely to you, then take it for granted that their rudeness really has nothing to do with you. Assume it, it reflects that they're having a bad day. And respond courteously. But for love covers a multitude of sins. But if someone's routinely rude, then speak up. 
let them know that you're uncomfortable, ask them for a way in which uh, you, they can suggest a workable solution so you can move forward. Our Lord Jesus had a righteous anger. He called out the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. He was not afraid to do that. Peter says in his scripture, in the book of Peter, for elders and pastors, that we're not to be domineering over the people, but to be examples to the flock. So that's very, very important. And so overall, our pastoral team and elders are not to be bullies to the flock. If you find that anybody's bad-mouthing you, whatever, undermining you, well, speak up, take someone with you if need be, try and sort it out. You don't have to remain silent. Now, where does all this stuff come from with the tongue? Well, you know that the scripture says to us that we'll be accountable for every word that we speak. It's pretty sober, isn't it? And in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, Matthew writes, But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness and slander. False witness and slander, the sins of the tongue. These things come out of the heart. So it's like our heart is a great artesian well and the artesian well just springs up of itself in the force from the earth and flows out over. And slander, false witness, the sins of the tongue come from the heart. And this is what the Lord of glory has come to do. He's come to save us from our sins. He's come to change our hearts. He's come to make us new creatures in Christ. He's come to do amazing, amazing work, something that you couldn't do, that I couldn't do, but he's come to do it, and it's all of his grace, it's all of his mercy, and that's why we need him. He's come to save us, and it should then change the way we speak to one another, the way we view one another in our marriages, in our family life, from one-to-one -one as members and pastor to people, people to pastor. So in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8 and 10, it says this, but now put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander and foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature, which has been renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We are new creatures in Christ and we are to live out that new creature, uh, new creature status in Christ by the power of his spirit. The facts are... We still sin. The facts are, we are not perfect this side. But God, by his grace, is making us a better people. He's making us where we're in a position that we can limit the damage we say with our tongue in home, in our members one-to-one, -one, and with our pastoral team as, as a well. And where we have sinned, there's that wonderful provision in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah for that. So we are to have a faith that doesn't hold on to hurts that come through the tongue. If there's some past hurt, if someone has now deceased that you can't fix it or attend to it, still take it to the Father. Pray about that. If there's a present hurt that's getting at you, yeah, take it to the Father. But you might still be able to go and talk with the person and sit down with them. And if it's that really important, take someone with you. What have you got to lose? God has made us to, and to be a people that rejoice with joy and peace in our relationship and not have unresolved hurt. Do something about it in humble dependence upon your God. Then a faith that doesn't hold on to hurts that comes through trials. You know, the book of uh, James talks a lot about trials. Consider it all joy, brethren, when you experience various trials. I don't know whether you've ever seen the film Unbroken by director Angelina Jolly. Anyone seen that film? It's, a, it's about a, an American soldier who was captive in the prison camp, a Japanese prison camp during World War II. And the commandant of the camp 
for whatever reason, had a real hatred for this man. Why? Because he had an indomitable spirit. He would not be broken no matter what. All the torture he went through and left out in the rain and lifting heavy beams and all this sort of stuff, he would not give in and allow his spirit to be broken by this man. But you know what? I'm sure he took all this to the Father in prayer. At the end of the war, what did he do? Well, he came back. And he came back to meet all the guards and said, I forgive you for the way you treated me. And the only person that wouldn't meet him was the commandant. He refused to meet him, who gave him the biggest trouble. But he had a faith that wouldn't hold on to hurts through the trials that he was faced during those particular bad times during the war. And he came back with a, with a forgiving spirit where he could forgive those captors Just imagine what powerful testimony that was to these men. A couple from biographies. I've been reading biographies and I want you to encourage you to be always reading something biographical in relation to mission people because it inspires you and it leads and guides you with different temperaments and opportunities. But I've been reading about Elizabeth Elliot and she wrote a book called Through Gates of Splendour and her husband was called Jim Elliot. And in 1956, Jim and four others went to the Orca Indians, now called the Worma tribe, to preach in Ecuador in the Amazon jungle to learn the language and to preach of Christ. But they landed on the beach in this section after being in the area for a while. They landed on the beach and they got out of their plane and they're looking around for these, uh, the, the uh, Orca Indians. And within the space of two minutes, every man was speared to death in the back. Now, Jim was in his early 30s. He had a daughter. She was only about 18 months. And Elizabeth, his wife, and Nate Snaith, uh, who was the pilot of the plane, his sister, Rachel, they ended up going back to these Orca Indians or the Worma tribe and they learned the language. They trans- translated scriptures into the language of these people. And they spent two or three at least two decades or more, working. But all of that time, Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel, the sister of the guy Spear, they could never, ever, ever get on. They were translating, and they lived and moved with different missions, but they wouldn't share the translation work. It was difficult to even have a conversation normally. It went on for two decades, and it really got to Elizabeth. It hurt her. And she wondered why. Here we are, two Christian women who couldn't work together on a similar project, honouring their husbands who died and honouring the father. But two decades it went on for. Do you know how she dealt with it? She just took it to the father in prayer. I put in the little bulletin here, something that you can cut out and put into into your Bible or somewhere precious for you, a prayer of surrender that she had. It was actually her husband's gym, but she adopted it as her own. Look at it. It says, Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my life, my all, utterly to thee, to be thine forever. Fill me and seal me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me as thou wilt, and work out thy whole will in my life at any cost now and forever. I don't think you can get a more inclusive prayer of surrender. That's how she dealt with it. So in relationship to this ongoing niggling time with Rachel, she surrendered it all to God in prayer. It was just one of these living with an unresolved relationship. And sometimes we've got to learn to do that as well, even though you might like it to be another way. And then another one for missionary over the years is Amy Carmichael. Well worth a read, her books and her biography. She was a missionary to India in the late 1800s. I think she died in 1901 or so. She was involved in rescuing girls who were going to get caught up in prostitution in the temple. And she had a little orphanage going and it was amazing work. She never went back to India, uh, went back to England. She had 51 years there 
in India. And for the last 20 years, she never got out of bed. She stayed in her room because she had a fall and hurt herself and something happened. She was just invalided. But she could pray and she could direct the mission people. But it was a great trial that she went through in suffering, but she continued an effective work for God where she was. She committed it to God in prayer. Now, these people I mentioned learn how to rejoice under trial and not hold on to their hurts, but allowed all they went through to deepen their trust in God. They learned to turn their hurts into prayers of surrender. Is any among you suffering? Is any of you hurt? Pray. Bring it to the Father. This is the way we need to go. I don't know what your trials or sufferings are today. They're probably nothing like that in that context. But I know one thing for certain, that we all have them. They just take a different colour, a different intensity. But you can bring them, you can pray, you can bring them to the Father. Because that's what our Lord Jesus did. That's what saints of God have done and do. Perhaps you've been passed over for a job or a promotion because of your faith and stance. Maybe you've been mocked or scoffed at for being a Christian at school or before your family. Even this week I gave something, a Christian booklet to my son. When I met him down, I took him down to the Southport and he just sort of went back in his chair like that. Oh, Dad, you know, that sort of thing. Well, it happens. No matter what the hurts, no matter what the trials we go through, bring it to God. Forgive. Lock yourself up to God and believe that God is continuing his sovereign work of making us image bearers, just like his son. He's committed to that. Hurts that are nursed and cradled brings birth to bitterness and resentments, which leads us away from our active faith and reliance upon God. Anything that does that is not good. We are to learn to lock ourselves up to God and him alone. In the middle 1800s, Spurgeon, a famous Baptist preacher, was preaching at the Metropolitan Tabernacle and he saw some skirmish thing happening in the back. He wasn't sure what happened. But see, in the back corner of this auditorium which seated, I think, 8,000 people, someone had yelled out, fire, fire! And there was a great mass of that corner of people and seven people died. There was no fire but they got trampled to death. And one of the deacons came up to Spurgeon at the front and whispered in his ear what had happened, and he just collapsed on the floor, just phew, taken out that seven people had died through such an irresponsible act. And then he had to go off for a whole week to a friend's place. He couldn't speak that night. He went off and just lay down, just absolutely physically and spiritually exhausted, hurt that someone would do that into his own congregation. And then by the end of that week, he's reading in Philippians chapter 2 that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he realised that he can't allow the hurt that he saw within his own congregation and that in un unjust act stop him from ministering. So he got up, went back and continued his work preaching in the church. In another context, Spurgeon wrote... I know nothing that can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of grief and sorrow, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a devout musing upon the subject of the Godhood. In other words, ponder God, pray to God, enjoy God. He will bring you out of your trials, will help you cope and bring you through in that sense, no matter what you face. And lastly, a faith that doesn't hold on to hurts that arise from unfulfilled expectations concerning healing. James 5 gives us some great uh, guidance there about healing. James says, well, what a joy it is to say when someone that you love and cared for is healed and that you've called the elders They've laid hands upon you, they've confessed, they've laid oil, they've prayed over you and you're healed. Let the sick one call the elders. I know one elder 
When he got to the sick bed of the man, said, I never did like you. And the man sick said, well, uh, the feeling's mutual. <laughs> so there was a confession of their sin together. I don't know what one of the fascinating people in, in, the, in, in the history of the church in the 20th century was C.S. Lewis. I don't know whether about, you know, the story about his wife, Joy Davidman. Well, one day she had tripped on the telephone cord and she fell heavily and broke a femur. And the doctor examined her and her bones were just riddled with cancer. Her condition was very, very serious and he gave her only a couple of days or two weeks at the most to live. And so C.S. Lewis called his friend, Pastor Peter Bide, to come and pray and lay hands on her. And I love the story of Peter Byrne, a very humble man. He said, well, God has often seemed to bring healing when I have prayed for them. He was giving the glory to God. It's not as if he had any special, special healing, but God had often been pleased to heal. So he went that day to the hospital bed and spoke with joy and laid hands upon her and prayed. And she went home. And she went from strength to strength. After a while, got out of bed, could cook could go out and tend to the garden, could walk up the hills and back. They had three wonderful, beautiful years of marriage together. It was a lovely, lovely story. From the deathbed, the doctor's giving you two days, maybe two weeks at max, to two years of beautiful joy. But what about when godly people seek their elders to come and pray in faith and that you're not healed, your child dies, your loved one dies. Paul, for instance, prayed three times that the thorn in his flesh be removed, but it wasn't. The answer to him is, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Well, in the chapter before James 5, there's the illustrations there about a man going into a town one day, he's going to do this and that, and the Lord says, if the Lord wills. The balance of scripture in relationship to healing is always if the Lord wills. G.H. Morling, who was the founder of the Baptist uh, Theological College in the 1920s, it's now called Morling College, changed into his name in honour of him. In the 60s, one of his daughters was dying of cancer. Now, he was a much-loved pastor and principal, and the people would gather together. And they would pray fervently for his daughter at this stage. She wasn't good. And the prayer meeting was going on. And then the prayer that gave freedom overall was, Lord, if you have a higher plan for her than what we're praying for, then we'll willingly embrace that for your glory. And that gave them liberty. And she did die. Even though they went through the process of calling, anointing and confessing sin. Sometimes it's according to his will. It happened to me in Perth with my late wife Rose, we called the elders, and our home group. We must have had 15 or 16 in the room praying that God's will, that he would heal her. And I had to deal with the hurt. I was not going to allow it to affect my faith. I was going to just pray to the Father that he take away the pain and the agony. But if he, he, could, he could heal her. I believe that, no doubt about it, because he does heal. God is the one who heals. But it's always couched in, if the Lord wills, as our Lord Jesus said, not thy will, but my, not my will, but thine be done. That is the balance of scripture overall. Keep your eyes, friends, on the bigger picture. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, neither things present you're going through, nor things to come. There is one watching over us who will arrange things for the best, and we can trust him, whether or not we think it's favourable or not, we can trust him. So is any of you suffering? Pray. Take it to the Father. Have any of you feeling the lash of the tongue and you've hurt or been hurt by someone in your family or another member, a friend, a pastor or elder? Pray. Take it to the Father. Take others to talk about it. Is anyone among you going through a deep trial that maybe you can't even talk with somebody? Pray about it. Ask God to help you or go and speak and seek counsel for mother. Is any of you sick and wanting healing? Call the elders. Take the word at the word. Call the elders. Humble yourself before God. And remember, if the Lord wills, 
he will bring glory to his name, if not in this life, in the next anyway. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow before you this morning. We thank you that you know all about us and we want to honour you. And we want to have a faith that keeps on pressing on and not allow hurts to hold us back and to simmer in our hearts unbelief and doubt. Remove them all, I pray. And give us graciousness, a graciousness and a love for one another and a trust in you that you'll put a, a guard over our mouths. You'll help us to keep our hearts with all diligence in relationship to what we say to one another and in our primary relationship with those we love. And also, Lord, when we go through and face certain trials, whatever they are and the difficulties, that we will trust you to bring glory to your, to your own name through us. And that, Lord, we will learn to bring it to you and lay it at your feet. And, Lord, if we need healing, we'll call the elders and trust you there as well. May your hand be upon these dear folk, Lord. May you build them up and strengthen them. And again, Lord, I pray for, on behalf of the people here, for Rick, as he faces the uncertainties of things with his back, may you lead and guide him and guide the surgeons and those that will look after him. For this we pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen.